Good morning and welcome to the second meeting in 2018 of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they are switched to silent. Uh, apologies have been received from Mary Gujon and Jackson Carlaw and I welcome Dean Lockhart to the committee as Jackson's substitute. Our first item of business today is an evidence session on Brexit and its effect on Scotland, in which we'll hear from the Minister for UK Negotiations on Scotland's place in Europe, Michael Russell. And I'd like to welcome the Minister, um, along with Ian Mitchell, uh, Deputy Director of External Affairs for the Scottish Government, and Stephen Morton, uh, the Economic Advisor, OCEA at the Scottish Government. And I'd like to invite the Minister to make an opening statement. I wasn't intending to do so, Convener, if that's acceptable. I, I think in view of the, the fact that you hear me quite often, I'd be quite happy to <laughs> move straight to questions. Right, that's, that's absolutely fine. That's more time for the members to ask questions, which is always a, a good thing. Uh, I'd like to start, if, if I may, with something that's been in the news over the last couple of days, which is the, the leak of the EU exit analysis, the cross Whitehall briefing. Um, we've had another indication of some of its contents today in terms of free movement and uh, the fact that uh, the, the briefing suggests that the end of free movement um, will be more Vera, damaging. Could I stop you for one yes. second and ask you to uh, suspend just for a minute or two? Um, I, I'm feeling slightly unwell and I'd just like to take a breath of air before I do. Yes, Do you mind I'm, if that would I'm be possible? To, I'm happy to suspend. I'm sorry about that. Yes.
Um, no. I'll now reconvene the meeting um, and uh, I trust that the Minister is, is feeling better uh, now. Um, as I was saying um, uh, earlier, um, the Minister will be aware of the, the leak of the EU exit analysis, the cross-Whitehall briefing, uh, and that today there has been a new development in that story in that uh, it, it's been suggested that in the, the briefing did look at free movement and suggested that uh, ending free movement of people would wipe out any gains that, that, the may, that may be achieved through, for example, a free, tra free trade agreement with the United States. Um, I wonder if the Minister has, ha has had any discussions um, with the UK Government around those areas and was uh, aware of uh, thinking within Whitehall uh, around the consequences of the end of free movement. Um, yes, we, we have had discussions about migration, uh, actually on quite a regular basis, because it's a very key issue for Scotland in in the Brexit debate, Scotland is um, very dependent upon EU migration and indeed rural Scotland uh, even more than the rest of Scotland. And uh, we did feel it was incumbent upon us as we pursued this argument to look at the facts. Uh, we do believe in evidence-led policy making. And Scotland's place in Europe has a <coughs> the publication we, we produced and uh, published on the 15th of January has a whole section on migration. And the figures are very clear uh, in terms of the, Scotland. Um, each additional EU citizen working in Scotland contributes £34,400 in GDP. The total contribution of EU citizens working in Scotland is about £4.42 billion every year. And on average, each additional EU citizen working in Scotland contributes £10,400 in government revenue. So um, EU migration is an economic positive. And therefore, I'm not surprised in the slightest that that is the evidence which, when examined dispassionately by civil servants and others in, in London for the Westminster government, will have produced the same result. And these figures dwarf <coughs> any anticipated um, benefits from new trade treaties. Uh, and this is evidence. You know, this, this isn't projection. This is evidence of what is taking place. In terms of the paper leaked to, to BuzzFeed, um, it does. We didn't look for validation from the UK government, uh, but it does appear to validate very much what we have published. And insofar as we know, the figures appear to be very similar from the, the figures that we have. This should give the UK government pause for thought, because the conclusion we draw, uh, it should be the conclusion they draw. The first of all, leaving the EU is economically and in every other way a bad idea. But if it is still to be pursued, then the only acceptable next step would be to continue in membership of the single market and the customs union. And I hope they are looking at the material in that way. The way in which they appear to be briefing against anybody who says otherwise perhaps means that they haven't quite got the message yet. I think also I've just finally observed, convener, that uh, when we published our paper, it was uh, roundly condemned by a range of UK government figures, including the Secretary of State for Scotland, who accused us of scaremongering. Uh, if these figures are, as they appear to be in a UK government publication, I think that they, those figures, including the Secretary of State for Scotland, have some explaining to do. Thank you very much. And you're aware that this committee uh, conducted an extensive inquiry into the benefits of EU migration, which came to broadly uh, the same conclusions. Uh, on uh, this particular topic around this BuzzFeed leak, it's interesting that you say it uh, should give the UK government pause for thought. But today in China, um, the Prime Minister has uh, seems to have... Um, been playing hardball on it in the suggestion that uh, that she does not agree that free movement um, should continue during a transition period, which uh, was the understanding of the agreement reached between the UK and the EU at sta stage one. And you'll be aware that on Monday, the 29th of January, General Affairs Council agreed supplementary directives for the negotiation. Uh, and they said that negotiations in the second phase can only progress as long as all commitments undertaken in the first phase are respected. Now, it would seem just today, judging from the Prime Minister's um, comments on free movement, that she's not respecting uh, what was agreed in the first phase of negotiations, and that might indeed jeopardise the second phase. And I wondered if you could maybe share your views on that. Well, I think the Prime Minister spends her life playing to whatever gallery she believes she needs to play to. And, and the, what we saw, I think, yesterday was playing to the, the Brexit, the hard Brexit gallery, who believe that transition, or as she calls it, implementation, will allow them to operate in just whatever way they wish. It won't. 
uh, that's been very clear from the, uh, um, the European side for some considerable time. Uh, if you remain within uh, the, the, the acquis, you have to observe all the conditions of the acquis, and that includes free movement. And there is an issue in here then of the date on which the right to remain under free movement would, uh, would expire. Uh, that clearly, in the view of the EU, would be the date in which transition ends, because it's part of the acquis. This, of course, is for negotiation. But the Prime Minister needs to think of the logic and the economic sense of her position. Because the more she detracts from EU uh, citizens wanting to work here, the more harm is done to the economy. So by making these statements, she may be playing to Jacob Rees-Mogg and others, but she's actually doing economic harm to her own country. Thank you. And, and just to return to the, um, to the exit an analysis that, that was leaked, um, the, the analysis suggests that um, every region of the UK would be adversely affected. Uh, and you've obviously reflected on the similarities with your, your, your own paper. Uh, but the Secretary of State for Scotland, uh, David Mundell, came before this committee and suggested to us that there was absolutely no uh, regional breakdown of any of the government's analysis uh, and was really quite specific about that. And um, I wondered if you shared our and my concerns that um, there seems to be a discrepancy now that we know that there was some kind of regional analysis of Scotland conducted in Whitehall. Well, I mean, that assumes Mr Mundell knew that that existed and perhaps he's not always in the loop. But if he did know, then clearly there is a question to be asked. I, I should point out I will be writing to the UK government today uh, asking for access to the document, but making it clear we will not take it on conditions of confidentiality or secrecy. The document needs to be published. I've asked to have a copy of it. If I receive a copy of it, then I'll make it available. Thank you. Um, I'll now hand over to Claire Baker. Um, thank you very much, um, convener. I would like to ask a few questions around the place in, sorry, Scotland's place in Europe. The recent document was published in January. Um, and what if the minister could say a bit about what um, they hope to achieve through the document. I know that he said the initial response from the UK government um, was largely was questioning the document and was to a degree dismissive. I understand that the European Minister is meeting today with um, the Deputy First Minister, John Swinney. Is there um, an expectation or a hope that there might be more productive discussions around the document that was published by the government away from the headlines of the media? Well, I'm always hopeful. Um, uh, it will be one of the topics that uh, David Liddington and David Mundell will discuss with John Swinney and myself later today, quite clearly, or the, the issues within it. Uh, I think the intention of the document are very clear. We published uh, uh, an original document in December 2016 that laid out the reasons why we believed that the UK should stay in the single market and the customs union, which failing an arrangement should be made to allow Scotland to remain within the single market. Um, we believe over the period of time that has elapsed that that argument has moved in our direction. Uh, the Prime Minister at that stage was arguing for no transition. She then, in the Florence speech, moved to transition. Uh, your own party has uh, moved a certain direction in these matters. And uh, you know, we believe that the arguments are unanswerable in this regard. But we wanted to present a case that not only reinforced where we were economically in terms of the difficulties, but also looked at the advantages foregone and that's quite a, a key issue. Uh, this is not simply about the damage that will be done, and it's laid out here, and obviously we believe laid out clearly in, in the documents that the UK government now has. But there are advantages which we are not going to have. For example, the, the continued expansion of the digital single market, which is exceptionally important to Scotland, uh, will not come in part or in full uh, to Scotland as if we leave the single market and the customs union. So it was important to lay that information out as well. The paper also does a number of other things. As, as I've indicated, it, it talks about migration, it talks it in, and it tries to change the narrative on migration. There is a negative narrative on migration coming from the UK government and sections of the media that needs to be challenged and changed. Migration is good. It is good for Scotland. We depend upon EU migration. Without it, we have very severe problems. So that needed to be put in context. And we also wanted to look at some of the flanking issues, uh, issues to do with alignment, uh, regulatory alignment, issues to do with some of the uh, social uh, policies that the EU has, and to show how important those are. So it's an attempt to reinforce the argument that we put out in December 2016, which attracted very substantial support, uh, to deepen and, 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 and broaden that argument, and to continue to show 
that it is possible, and I think this is a really key point, that it is possible to approach this issue in a rational, evidence-based way. Uh, and that's really important because we don't see much of that. Uh, so we put this on the table and we work very closely, for example, with economists and others, with academics, to show that the, there needs to be an evidence-led process rather than the process we've seen from the UK government. Um, thank you. Um, uh, myself, I, I campaigned for Remain, as did the Minister, and I don't think any of us really want to be in this situation. Uh, the favoured proposal of the government to remain within the single market, do you foresee any um, difficulties with this? You mentioned alignment and regulation. There has been talk of a democratic deficit within that model and that we would have to um, abide by the rules but have no say in the rules. That's one of the reasons why I didn't agree with us leaving the EU that we'd end up in this situation. But how do you see any difficulties in particular for Scotland if we reach that situation? Well, it's not as good as being uh, within as a member of the EU. You know, there's no, there's no doubt about that. There's no point in pretending otherwise. But it's better than being in, you know, right out on the fringes. And I mean, the, 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 the information in here is clear. The next the least bad step is to stay in the single market and, and, and the customs union. You can see how that works for Norway, how it works for the EEA and EFTA members. There is a clear route for the UK to do so. Um, it would also make the process of negotiation much, much simpler because the parameters of negotiation are entirely clear. So, yeah, it's not as good as being in, 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 you know, the, the, in the thing, but it is the next least bad option. Uh, the further you go away from it, the worse the options become. Uh, you know, the, the chart uh, in the document, and I know many of you have the document, but the chart um, on page 7 from the Commission itself about future relationship shows these steps being taken, uh, taken, and it shows it's the UK red lines that are creating the economic difficulties. So as you go through these, you move from EFTA EEA membership uh, through the, the Swiss relationship, the treaty-based relationship, to the Ukrainian, Ukraine and Turkish relationship, and you end up only in a free t trade model. Uh, now, the free trade model uh, you know, is not nearly as good as what exists now, uh, and that, but we analyse that too. And then beyond that, then you go into WT only. Now, I, I went to the WTO in Geneva last October. Uh, clearly, the WT only situation is very, very problematic and challenging. And if the UK document shows, as we believe it does show, and as we've seen, uh, the advantage to be gained by these mythical trade treaties is very substantially less, both than the benefit of migration and the benefit of staying in the EEA, then there's a logical inference to be drawn. And that logical inference is let's stay as high up this hierarchy as we possibly can, and that is the EEA after membership, which is perfectly open and possible uh, for the UK. If it's not possible and open for the UK, there are means by which it would be possible for Scotland. We argue those in the first document, and those are worth looking at. But it's important to say we're offering a compromise in this. You know, we, we're not being didactic about this and saying, oh, we're off to do this. We're saying a compromise is possible, and the compromise is for the whole of the UK to stay in. There then is, I don't want to, to add more elements of complexity to this, but then there's the implications of whatever the arrangement is with Ireland, and if that is based on regulatory alignment, then there are issues that arise, particularly for Scotland, in that, and also in the common frameworks issue we've been discussing with the UK government, uh, so that which also dictate that we should remain uh, within the single market and the customs union. Uh, just one fin final question. Uh, we had interesting discussions in Ireland last week, and I'm sure other members will pick up on that. Um, the document focuses on an investment and, and jobs in the, in the economy. Uh, the STUC have um, produced a number of uh, measures where they um, think the Scottish Government could make progress. A lot of that is about trying to influence and encourage the UK Government. However, they do talk about um, calling for immediate action to establish investment plans for sectors that are most likely to be affected by Brexit. Um, I'd just like to ask if there is work being taken forward uh, based on that suggestion from STUC. Are we at the stage yet of well, trying to work out which sectors in Scotland are likely to have the most significant impact and how we respond to that. I meet, uh, I mean, this, you could call this document a summary of sectoral analysis, you know, because obviously a lot of work is done in talking to sectors. And I meet sectors on a, on a regular, almost daily basis. I was with, uh, I met the NFUS yesterday. Uh, you know, I tend to meet people very often, pharmaceuticals, uh, health uh, care sector last week, a week before last. And you know, our view of this is that we do need to provide 
as much help as we can to each of those sectors. It's difficult to say one sector will be worse affected than another at the moment because actually almost every sector will have problems of, of the three sets of problems that arise out of Brexit. Problems with workforce and availability of labour, uh, problems with finance and, and problems with regulation. But yes, uh, you know, we are discussing, we discuss these in detail, but the confusion from the UK government is the biggest single problem now, and that applies to money as well. Let me give you an example. In the agriculture sector, when Michael Gove spoke to the Oxford Farming Conference, um, rather memorably, I heard somebody say the other day, he, he mentioned the archers more often than he mentioned the devolved administrations. Um, but the, in that, he, he promised, allegedly, that farming payments would continue unchanged to 2024. We've not had that confirmed with us financially. So you know, the money we would require to make the, the equivalent con the, uh, uh, pledge has not been confirmed, nor do we actually think that there is Treasury cover for what he actually promised south of the border. So there's huge confusion in this, and the confusion about fiscal flows is very substantial too. You know, I, I was in the room down below this uh, last night uh, where there was a reception for those uh, people undertaking the rural leadership course, which Mr Lockhead will remember, which has now been expanded to take in uh, the Highlands and Islands in my own constituency. And you know, the issues arising in the discussion I had with my constituents last night were precisely about that security of finance on Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 in terms of rural support. And the fact that whilst there is some assurance on Pillar 1 in a limited period of time, there is none on Pillar 2 at all at the moment, which means very substantial sums that are going into rural Scotland to support rural development. We just do not know what is going to happen. So, of course, we will do everything we can uh, to support sectors. We talk to the STUC often, we talk to a whole range of people, and we will go on doing so. But the reality is that um, until we have assurances ourselves, it's difficult to do. Assurance on free movement of people would help enormously. That, that would actually you know, be even better than having investment plans. But there's nothing like it. OK, thank you. Okay. Uh, before I pass to Stuart McMillan, I just want to ask a quick supplementary. Um, going back to your comments on WTO rules, uh, in our inquiry last year, the, the committee took a great deal of evidence from trade experts uh, on um, future free trade deals <coughs> and Scotland's involvement uh, in future free trade deals, or the, rather the dangers of Scotland not being involved in the negotiation of future free trade deals. Um, and we looked at examples where, for example, Canada, the Canadian provinces were at the table um, when Canada was negotiating with the EU. Um, as a result of that, the committee recommended uh, in its report that means is found to involve the Scottish Government in bilateral and uh, quadrilateral discussions on future trade deals. Now, we're told that Liam Fox is already discussing future trade deals, which would be signed at the end of the transition period. And I wondered uh, if uh, the Scottish Government had in any way been in included uh, in, at an early stage in discussions around those issues? I think you'd be cr incredibly surprised if I said yes. No, of course, uh, that has not happened. It is part of the context of trying to get clear from the UK government what the involvement of the devolved administrations is in the phase two of the negotiations with Europe and what flows from them. Uh, and this, of course, is meant to be covered by the terms of reference of JMCEN, which are very clear on this matter, uh, and which I read into the record yesterday uh, at the uh, committee, uh, and I'm happy to do so again if, if it was helpful to you. But you know, within those is the uh, oversight of the um, Article 50 negotiation. Indeed, uh, Ian has very helpfully provided me with this. There are four uh, terms of reference, four issues in the terms of reference, JMCEN. Discuss each government's requirements for the future relationship with the EU. It hasn't happened. Seek to agree a UK approach to and objectives for Article 50 negotiations. We never saw the Article 50 letter. It was never discussed with us, and the meetings stopped in February when it became an issue. Provide oversight of negotiations with the EU to ensure, as far as possible, that outcomes agreed by all four governments are secured from these negotiations. That is crucial in terms of where we go on phase two and there is no proposal on the table. Last year, MCEN, we asked for that proposal, Mark Drakeford and I. We have not received it, and that will be an issue today with David Livington. And to discuss issues stemming from the negotiation process, which may impact on or have consequences for the UK government, the Scottish government, the Welsh government, the Northern Ireland executive. Now, that also covers the trade issue. Now, there is a commitment, and you know the, Sc the Scotland Act deals with it, and the Memorandum of Understanding deals with us being involved in issues of international 
uh, uh, treaties which uh, impact upon us. We have no such proposals on the table. And could I just stress, for the record, that those terms of reference were agreed between the four governments in Downing Street at the JMC plenary in October uh, 2016. And they have not been honoured by the UK government. Uh, and that's a very serious concern. In fact, the JMC plenary last met a year ago on Tuesday uh, in Cardiff. It hasn't met since. And the JMC EN, which was meant to meet monthly in the last 12 months, has met only three times, February, October and December. Thank you. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, actually, it kind of takes me on to some uh, GMC questions. Now, after what you've just said there, Minister, uh, can you uh, give us a, an honest appraisal in terms of how useful actually is the GMC process? Well, is it worth it? We believe it could on? be useful. I mean, you know, the JMC process has been in existence since the start of devolution. It's broadly been re regarded by parliamentary committees in all the parliaments uh, and by academic study as not fit <coughs> for purpose. It, it's, it's not robust. <coughs> it doesn't have a statutory footing. There is no decision making. Um, and it's always held in London. Uh, it's always convened by. Uh, the UK government. And in fact, it has been held twice outside London, once under Labour and a year ago in Cardiff, but that's all. Uh, I was a member of the JMC uh, various committees when I was external affairs minister in 2009. Uh, even then, it was it was pretty problematic. Uh, I went to JMC E on one occasion in which there were, I think, 21 UK ministers present, myself and Rodri Morgan. It wasn't really an equity of arms in terms of the discussion. That being said, when we came to discuss how we would liaise and, and negotiate on the issues of European withdrawal, uh, it was clear it was the only thing we had, and that's why we established this new part of it. But it had a clear written terms of reference, and that was agreed by all of us. If those clear written terms of reference had been observed, then things might have worked. But so far they haven't. Now, it's important that Mark Drakeford and I as the Welsh and Scottish members go and take part and argue and, and make sure we're heard. And I pay tribute to Damien Green, who was getting it into shape. We had reduced the membership, had focused it, was listening. Uh, I personally regret that he's not doing that any longer. We will have to see what David Liddington does. But, you know, David Liddington is starting from a standing start on this, uh, and, you know, and there's not a lot of time in it. So we want to see a, a step change in the operation of the JMC, but... I'm not hopeful that that will take place. But you mentioned a few moments ago in terms of the, the terms of reference, uh, and, that, uh, and certainly there's been no proposals on the table, uh, particularly regarding the, uh, the future trading uh, relationships. Now, I, mean, I, I, well, I would argue, and I'm quite sure others would argue too, that I mean, clearly there's been a, an absolute breakdown in the GMC process there. I'm not sure it's a breakdown. I'm not sure I ever did it to start with. I mean, I, you know, I don't want to pick to split hairs, but it, the JMC could be used for that purpose. Uh, it, it could convene on a monthly basis with a substantive agenda. Uh, there could be you know, uh, uh, contact between ministers between meetings on trade issues. Officials do meet and have continued to meet, but I, I think it's fair to say that the quality of that engagement has deteriorated since the Brexit vote, and it has been difficult to get substance out of it. Um, so the system isn't working. Now, we're doing our very best to make it work. You know, I've put in a lot of time to this. We're you know, a lot of travel to it. You know, we, we do our very best. It's not been helped, I accept, by the Northern Ireland executive not being in, pre in existence. Uh, it's not been the, the, the fatal flaw. But JMC EN membership, when it started out, included Martin McGuinness and Arlene Foster, who had chosen... The, the two first, the first minister and deputy first minister had chosen to be members of it. So it was a substantive discussion that was taking place that Martin was very much and is very much missed in that regard. Uh, and it has simply got more and more difficult. But I'm committed to it. I, I can't speak for my Welsh colleague, but I believe he is also committed to it. Uh, we would like it to work. But, you know, it, if I may use the Chancellor's phrase, it takes two to tango. Uh, and another area, just in terms of um, discussions with uh, other ministers from uh, the UK Parliament, um, it's been reported certainly in the past that there was uh, an agreement uh, in terms of amendments to go forward to the EU withdrawal bill, and they clearly haven't taken place uh, through the Commons process. And we're now relying upon 
um, some amendments to take place throughout the House of Lords. Now, do you think that's been a, a positive way forward, or do you think that's been a, a, retro, a retrospective and a retrograde uh, well, way forward? Well, there, there is an agreement that the UK government would discuss with the devolved administrations and agree with the devolved administrations amendments to the EU withdrawal bill. This has been a long, long saga. Uh, the bill was published on the 13th of June, July, I think. We saw it two weeks beforehand. We made it absolutely clear it was unacceptable. The convention would be that they would be working together on the bill over a period of time, but we, we, we were not given access to it. I asked, actually, to see it. I asked the Prime Minister directly at the JMCP to see it, and we, did, we never got it. Um, when we said it was unacceptable, uh, you know, we, were, we were not treated necessarily with much seriousness. But when it became clear that the Welsh and Scottish governments were united on this and were not willing to give legislative consent to the areas that require legislative consent, over a period of time this changed, and I, I, I'm grateful for the Conservatives in the Scottish Parliament to have taken a clear position on this too and to have said that the bill is not acceptable at the present time to anybody. The Finance and Constitution Committee took that view. The Welsh Parliament has taken it unanimously, um, as a result of which it was agreed in early December, although we put forward joint amendments, um, they were voted down by the Conservatives, um, those would have been acceptable. Um, there, were, there, there was then a, a Labour amendment at report stage which was acceptable to us, which was also voted down by the Conservatives, but there was a commitment given that there would be an amendment at report stage, it didn't happen. Um, we are now told there will be an amendment in the Lords. We have not seen the amendment, therefore it is not agreed. Um, uh, you know, and until we see the amendment, there is no amendment. And then there will therefore be no, um, with, uh, no legislative consent. Simply won't happen. Now, we have to be prepared for withdrawal. You know, uh, even though we don't want it, and even though it might be avoided, we have to be prepared for withdrawal. So in those circumstances, we have worked on and have taken to the presiding officer a continuity bill, as the Welsh have done, and uh, you know, we will bring that forward at an appropriate time as a belt and braces approach, because we can't just be left with nothing. Uh, you know, the position we are in is not you know, simply one that we think is bad. The, the, the debate in the House of Lords on Tuesday, on, um, Tuesday and Wednesday on the withdrawal bill, the, the second reading debate, uh, had a, 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 a succession of peers none of whom were, were, were mad gnats, I have to say, who were saying very, very clearly that they thought the Scottish government had been badly treated. David Steele said it. Uh, Lord Hope's speech is, is a very strong, and he's a leader of the crossbench, it's a very strong and clear speech. That he believes this has been very badly handled by the UK government. And I noted that Ian Lang um, commended Lord Hope's speech, so it spreads right across the chamber. So we now look to see what takes place. But you know, we are, we've been consistent, absolutely consistent and clear about this. It's, you know, we're, we're, we're very transparent. We can't accept the bill. There won't be a legislative consent motion. We will bring forward a continuity bill as belt and braces, uh, but we'd like to get uh, this amendment agreed. But if there is no amendment, you can't agree. So you mentioned uh, Lord Hope uh, there, and uh, it, was a, it was something I was going to come on to. I mean, I mean, part of his speech, I think, is extremely damning. Uh, and, uh, and I wanted to put this to you, the Minister. He, he said in his speech, as far as I know, Henry VIII never got to Scotland, but Oliver Cromwell did. And he and the forces under his command did quite a lot of damage while he was there. I think that these clauses have a touch of Oliver Cromwell about them. Uh, I would suggest that that is uh, a pretty damning um, uh, indictment uh, of the UK government's approach. But also Lord Bridges. Uh, Lord Bridges, um, his speech was also very useful. Uh, where he states that uh, my fear is that we will get meaningless waffle in a political declaration in October. The implementation period will not be a bridge to a clear destination. It will be a gangplank into thin air. Now, uh, I wanted to put them on the record, but also uh, to get any further commentary from you in terms of I mean, what you think about their uh, contributions, uh, but also in terms of any of the, any of the lords that, uh, that yourself or uh, or members of the Scottish Government have spoken to to try to uh, encourage them to uh, have uh, further discourse and also to make well, positive I, amendments. Well, I held a briefing along with Mark Drakeford um, in the House of Lords on Monday night. It was standing room only, I'm glad to say. 
Uh, it was a very uh, encouraging discussion. I think there was only one uh, strongly discordant voice, the, the voice of, of uh, Michael Forsyth, um, but uh, in, the others present were very positive and wanted to see this bill changed. Uh, Lord Hope, I, I've spoken to on a couple of occasions, um, and I was very, uh, saw him on Monday night, and I was very impressed by his speech. I, I might uh, swap one quotation with, for a, a, another quotation. Um, I am astonished by this bill's failure to respect that settlement, that is a devolved settlement, in its formulation of the regulation making powers given to ministers. And he went on to say the Scottish ministers have declared they will not put a legislative consent motion before the Scottish Parliament until their objections to this are met. As a mere lawyer, I'm in, I'm in full sympathy with that objection. You know, this is, this is a very profound, and it's a very strong speech. I, I commend it to people to read, but there are, as you indicate, many other speeches. Uh, David Steele's speech is very strong. Jim Wallace's speech is very strong. Um, I, I think this is you know, quite clear where we are. Now, the UK government is a government. It needs to come you know, to this parliament with a proposal for an amendment to discuss that sensibly, and then to we will come to an agreement where, if we can. You know, but we must stop having meetings about meetings, and we must stop dragging this out endlessly. So you know, that will be, I have to say, the message that John Swinney and I put very clearly, I hope, today, uh, politely, when welcoming David Liddington to Scotland, we are very clear what the situation is. And I don't want, we don't want to leave him in any doubt about this. The time for talking about this is well over. We need a proposal. We need to look at that proposal and, and debate it as adults. We need to come to a conclusion on it. And if the UK government doesn't want to do that, when we understand that. And then you know, f there flows from that a set of consequences. But this constant sitting on the fence, which is what happens in their negotiations with Europe, is bedeviling their relationship with the devolved administrations too. Thank you. Well, Hamilton. I was actually going on to a new subject. Is that OK, um, convener, about um, transition? Well, you can ask whatever Remus, you like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just uh, wondered, um, Mr Russell, what your thoughts are on the requirements for the um, transition period or implementation period, as the UK government are calling it. Um, I was at the Rural Leadership Group as well last night um, talking to young people working in agriculture, running businesses. Um, perhaps you'd like to... Um, discuss specifically about how the trans how the um, NFUS are talking about what they require from the transition agreement um, and also just just on that point do you think that it's sufficient that the, the transition period will run until the 31st of December 2020 well what business wants uh, uh, and you know what agriculture's business wants is 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 certainty they need to understand that there is some certainty the uncertainty of this has been created by the UK government. Uh, there are issues to do with creating common frameworks. I mean, we've indicated that common frameworks are, will be required. We've no difficulty with that. Uh, but those common frameworks have to be on the basis of agreement between the nations of the UK rather than by imposition, something that David Mundell himself has accepted. And that's why the, the Clause 11 issue in the withdrawal bill is so important. But if we can get some certainty about the framework, then that will be helpful. Um, transition uh, is about continuing the acquis until it comes to an end. There isn't any other type of transition. You know, we started off with the UK government saying there was to be no transition. Um, this was not necessary. The Prime Minister then moved to a position where transition she saw as being necessary, whether it's called implementation or not. Uh, the period set for that is bounded presently by the conclusion of the uh, multi-annual financial framework that the EU has, which will come present uh, phase of which comes to an end at the end of December uh, 2020. Many commentators believe that that period of time will not be enough, um, and some EU governments believe that too. The Irish government has indicated that they think a longer period will be required. It, it depends what you use transition for. Uh, if transition is used to, to create circumstances in which there is no cliff edge and there is a smooth set of changes, uh, that would, to me, imply that transition leads to continuing single market membership, which is not quite the same. You know, transition isn't that. Transition is a continuation of the acquis. It's a continuation of full membership, but without the rights, which seems to be the worst of all possible worlds and how any government could get itself into that position, I don't know, but that's what it means. So at the end of December, then you, you could transition into the INEFTA EEA membership, and that would give you some certainty. If it's simply postponing the cliff edge, you know, 
then it's not going to be very helpful to people at all. So I would hope that in the basis of, we've discussed the reports that the UK government now has, on the basis of the well-sourced information that we've produced, then transition might be used to try and to move into a single market membership and that becomes destination. That would be sensible and that would give, from the very beginning, some security because we would know what we were aiming at. If it's not, then we still don't know what we're aiming at because this so-called deep and special partnership has no meaning uh, within the established relationships that exist. Thank you for that. Do you think that there could be um, an extension to the Article, Article 50 negotiations? That's a, that's a curiously awkward question for anybody to answer because there is a procedure to extend the Article 50 process, but that's not the procedure that's presently being used. Um, and indeed, the difficulty of extending the Article 50 process means extending membership. Now, there are members of your own party who would regard extending membership as tantamount to treason. Uh, and in those circumstances, they would be very unhappy about extending membership. There are some technical issues in extending membership that are quite difficult. European elections are confirmed for June 2019. There wouldn't seem much point in electing people who are not going to be there for very long. So there are issues there. So what is, what is being attempted is to create a special set of circumstances which will bridge to something else. But it would be helpful to know what it was bridging to. Um, and there is a clear possibility, which I think has been indicated by almost everybody, would be achievable, which would be to bridge to single market membership. That's a sensible thing to do. Uh, I mean, leaving isn't sensible. But if you're going to do that, then the sensible thing to do is to bridge to single market membership. OK, and um, lastly, um, are, is, is the Scottish Government putting any provision into uh, the, the transition period to allow businesses to prepare for that? What conversations, and I'm sure you're having many conversations um, with different sectors, but, but what is it that, that we are doing? What is it the Scottish Government are doing to prepare people? Well, the first thing we're doing is trying to get the UK Government to tell us what's going on. You know, and if you could assist in that, that would be very helpful, uh, because you know, we just don't know. Um, we are obviously doing everything within our power, for example, in the discussion of the frameworks, to create the circumstances in the devolved competencies where we will continue to have a clear policy in place. You know, we've, we've been very constructive. Our officials have been very constructive in negotiating on the issues of the, the, the frameworks and what will be required. But, you know, the heart of this is a decision by the UK government to take an action which they are not clear about how they're taking, what the resourcing is of that, and what the outcomes will be. So my position with business across Scotland is to work very closely with them to find any ways I can to mitigate the problems they have. But, for example, if you look at the, if you look at the pharmaceutical sector, there are, there are probably two things that would leap to mind immediately. One is that there are a number of companies in Scotland that do drug testing, which uh, the, the European regulations require those companies, if you do drug testing in the EU and EU regulations, to be in the EU. If, those com if we are not in the EU, those companies will have to relocate. No ifs, no buts. They will have to relocate. Now, you know, we can't assist in relocation of companies outside Scotland. That's, that's a really crucial issue. So that's a, an issue presented by the UK government, which they cannot resolve, because I'm sure they will not assist companies to relocate outside the, the country. The second part of that is there needs to be an absolute clarity about medicines and, and, and medical devices licensing. And you know, we had complete nonsense about this from Michael Gove and, and, and Boris Johnson during the Leave campaign about how companies would leap to have a, a, a special UK post-Brexit licensing regime. Uh, it's, it was complete nonsense. The, the, the drug companies will tell you very graphically what nonsense it was because drug companies who invest very substantial amounts of money will go for uh, uh, regulation in the biggest markets first because that's where the biggest return is. This is fairly obvious. So if you are going to go for uh, a new drug, you will want to get European approval and you will want to get American approval, two biggest markets. Those two regimes, incidentally, are coming together in, 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 a, in an agreement later this year. You will not go for the UK, which will be less than 3% of the market. You'll go for the UK when you've done everything else. So rather than getting earlier regulation and better regulation, you'll get later and worse regulation. Now, those companies are having now to make arrangements 
to have regulatory activity outside the UK because it's the only way they can guarantee to continue to sell drugs. The, I think the Parkinson Society, did they give you evidence? They gave another written evidence to one of the parliamentary committees on their fears about what this would mean in terms of supply of drugs. I've heard this from pharmaceutical companies too. Now, I, can't, I cannot solve that problem. I can articulate it. I can articulate it to the UK government and to yourselves. But the UK government needs to say very clearly, this is going to happen with the Medicines Agency. They've already lost the jobs. This is how we're going to operate. And this is going to solve this problem. So far, they haven't. Can, can I just I have to move on oh, because okay. of the three I'll other members who time. need to ask questions? Sure. Richard Lockhead. Uh, thanks very much. <clears throat> in terms of the implementation period, Minister, the Scottish White Fish Producers Association, which is the biggest constituent member of the Scottish Fishermen's Federation uh, in terms of the catching sector, have tweeted all the Scottish Conservative politicians this week and all the UK ministers expressing concern that the fishing industry should not be drawn into any implementation period and using the hashtag no going back. Is your view that the UK government are preparing to sell out the fishing industry, that the fishing industry will be part of the implementation period? Because quite clearly, I suspect the other EU member states are not going to allow the UK to cherry pick. Uh, and therefore, we are facing the UK government breaking a big promise uh, once again to the Scottish fishing industry. Well, I, I have been, in, I, I was myself included in those, um, in those tweets. Uh, uh, the, obviously, the, uh, the white fish producers are very concerned about it. It is clear that the EU understand the special issues of agriculture and fisheries with regard to the continuing acquis and particularly with regard to annual negotiations that take place. So I don't think there is an, a, a lack of realisation that this is an issue with the EU, but they, they are determined that the acquis should be uh, continued. And indeed, you know, other countries uh, will not wish to give up their rights during this period. Um, so I think it is inevitable that uh, it will have to be included within the uh, transition period. And in those circumstances, the UK government uh, will have no option. Now, you know, they might have said so. It might have been helpful you know, in the implementation, discussion of implementation, if the Prime Minister had indicated that. You know, in her Florence speech, she seemed to be you know, quite unaware of it. It's even worse. In fact, it's pretty unforgivable that then you have you know, the responsible Cabinet Minister, Michael Gove, indicating that, of course, that will not apply. You know, immediately indicating it. We had this from Ian Duncan, too. In fact, we had it on a platform I was, I was on with him, an NFU platform in, in, um, in Dunkeld in November, where he blithely asserted that the common agricultural policy would not apply um, even during the transition period, which is simply untrue. So the, the, the UK government have had a lot of mixed messages. It would have been much better about them being honest, but I see little possibility of, of, of anything happening, except there will be an understanding of the need to ensure consultation of some sort, and I'm sure there will be that. But, you know, the, 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 the Aki will continue, as far as all of us know, unchanged for that period of time, and that means those policies continue in place. Two more questions. Firstly, in terms of the implementation period, if fishing is part of that... That would suggest there's the potential for having the worst of all worlds from the perspective of the Scottish fishing industry and our fishing communities in that negotiations will take place. Uh, no doubt there will be some arrangement made to allow the UK to somehow have a discussion with other member states over the allocation of quota and fishing rights, but clearly it will be less status than being a full member state because we will not be a member state. Therefore, Scotland's position will be even more distant from the actual <coughs> negotiations and decisions, despite the fact that we have two-thirds of the fishing industry, uh, for the UK's fishing industry, uh, in Scotland. Therefore, do you agree that would be the worst of all worlds for no, you know, fishing better than you do. You know, I mean, you know, you know, I've worked with you for, for a long time. You know, you've gone through the, the, the difficulties of annual fisheries rounds. You've come back looking haggard from, from bus. I even represented you on one occasion at the Fisheries Council. Uh, uh, you know, the reality of the situation is exactly as you have described it. This is a worse situation for Scotland uh, than the situation they found themselves in, a more difficult situation, more fraught with problems, and it has been created by people who made false promises. You know, and that's really what we should be looking at. 
you know, I mean, when you have Michael Gove stravaging around the fish markets of the northeast of Scotland, making promises to people which he knows he cannot keep, then I do think that devalues the whole business of politics. And that's exactly what has happened. And that needs to be explained and understood. Nobody is defending the common fisheries policy. I'm not. And, you know, as you know, I have, you know, fishing interests, substantial fishing interests in my own constituency. Nobody is defending that. But actually, there needs to be an honesty about the people who, who said one thing and now are going to be delivering quite another thing. Okay. Thank you. And, of course, my, my point was that the potential is that we'll have the worst of all worlds because yeah. we won't be in the EU, we won't be out of the EU, yeah. but we'll be in this no man's land that will leave Scotland in a very bad place in terms of negotiations over our fishing communities. My final question uh, goes back to an initial comment you made about the importance uh, of the um, Irish position in terms of any potential special deal that may be created for uh, the Irish and we all recognise yeah. the importance of uh, the issues around the hard border on Ireland and the impact in the North of Ireland. However, do you agree with me that there's a danger that if there's a special deal for the Irish, who largely depend on exporting to the UK and, of course, via the UK to Europe, but there's no special deal for Scotland, then our businesses, particular agri-food sector, will be a major competitive disadvantage, and that could potentially inflict even more economic damage on Scotland. There is a potential for that. I mean, I, I should absolutely stress that we, you know, we have always supported uh, a sensible solution in Ireland, you know, of recognising the very special issues that arise in Ireland, and particularly the issues of the Good Friday Agreement. So you know, we, we don't in any way try to make comparisons in that regard. But I think it is obvious that there are difficulties inherent in the Irish arrangement for Scotland. Um, if that arrangement is one that creates uh, uh, an advantage for Northern Ireland uh, in trading terms, then we would have to look at that very carefully in terms of our own um, activities. There are other complications I indicated, for example, in the frameworks issue, that if there is full regulatory and dynamic regulatory al alignment between our, uh, Northern Ireland and Ireland, that ties into the EU regulatory structures, how we would then be able to establish a common framework on agriculture, for example, within these islands would be very difficult to see because if that common framework include Northern Ireland, it would automatically be in full regulatory alignment with the EU. So, and that's not being, in fact, the UK government's refusing to address this with us, but you know, that is a very serious set of concerns. We have close relationships in Northern Ireland and in Ireland. I am giving evidence next Wednesday. The next committee I give evidence to will be the joint uh, Senate uh, Doyle Committee I I I in, in Ireland. And, you know, there is a very clear understanding that those issues need to be teased out and discussed. And indeed, I will be visiting uh, agri-food business in, in Ireland next Wednesday morning to understand them fully. Thank you very much. Now, we don't have very much time left, and we've got two members uh, who still need to ask questions. Mm -hmm. So I would urge uh, questions and answers to be as succinct as possible. Uh, Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning, uh, Minister. I'd like to move on to trade and specifically the plans to open the, the Paris and Berlin hubs. I wonder if you could provide a brief update on specific dates when the hubs might be open. Well, there is an appointment to Berlin uh, and uh, she is ready to start work and I think that will be starting within months, I mean, I think in the early spring. Um, I think the Paris appointment is, is imminent, so I would expect Paris to be operating during the first half of the year. This is, I should point out, responsibility of my colleague Fiona Hislop, uh, so it is subject undoubtedly to the information she would give you, but that's what I understand to be the case. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, last week, trade figures uh, published for 2016 showed a decline in Scotland's exports to the single market. I wonder if you could briefly give your views as to what might have caused that decline. Well, again, that would be a matter for, for Keith Brown, but I think that the figures indicate a strong growth in, in Scottish trade. Uh, there will be fluctuations from year to year about how it takes place. Um, there is no doubt that continuing to trade both with the rest of the EU and within the UK and more widely are all objectives that we should continue to operate. And we shouldn't put anything in their way. Now, uh, you, you would no doubt say that uh, you know, having any difference in the constitutional arrangements north and south of these islands would put something in their way. I would indicate that the policy of Brexit will put something substantial in its way. We would want to continue to, to, to trade in the best way possible, which actually is likely to be guaranteed by continued membership of the customs union in the single market better than any other arrangement. I wonder if we could briefly look at the assumptions that were used uh, 
in the paper showing the impact, the Scottish Government's paper showing the impact of Brexit on trade. I believe the WTO option assumes a 50% decline in trade with the single market. Can you briefly talk us through what assumptions were applied in reaching that conclusion? Well, I think the best person to do that, with the greatest respect, would be Stephen Morton, who is a man who understands the model even better than I would understand it. So I think perhaps you would, might want to just say what those are. Yeah. So for the trade shock on the WTO scenario, um, the assumptions are drawn from the, the sort of economic literature on the subject, and in particular, a paper by um, Bell and Warren, uh, who are NISA um, researchers, and it's drawn it's drawn mainly from that. That was also the assumptions used by the Fraser of Allender, who did the report that was for the I think it was for this committee. And um, they also drew on that paper for their for their um, shock in the WTO scenario. Okay, and one very brief supplemental. Uh, since 2011, uh, exports, Scottish exports to the single market have been in decline for that six-year period. I wonder if, if Mr Morton has a view as, uh, as to what's caused that decline over the past six years in Scottish exports to the EU. Mm, I don't have the figures off, offhand with me here, but uh, I, I believe they were broadly, broadly similar over the last year. Uh, 2016, of course, was a, was a difficult year for the economy as a whole, um, so that, that perhaps had something to do with the, the latest figures. Thank you. Thanks, convener. Um, two brief questions, Minister. Uh, first one regards to customs union and government scenario planning around that. Um, if we're working on the UK government's current policy, which is leaving the customs union rather than what seems to have been agreed in stage one, which is something that's not qu quite that, um, I know, I'm aware that the government's done broader macroeconomic um, projections around this, but what work has been done in terms of um, scenario planning for the infrastructure requirements, uh, for example, at Cairn Ryan, that would be needed? Well, we have. We know that the industry. I've met with the Chamber of Shipping and various others. We know the industry has d done a, a, a fair degree of scenario planning on this. They're pretty alarmed by the outcomes. Um, there are some interesting straws in the wind in this. Uh, the, the Richard Lockhead, I know, has has looked at the issue in Rotterdam and the increase in customs officers that, that Rotterdam Port is planning to have, the implication of that would be that there, there would therefore be further checks and you would require greater infrastructure at the East Coast ports in, in England uh, in order to deal with that. I think the view presently is a wait-and-see view uh, that, that nobody knows as yet. It's one of these many things that's affected what the situation is going to be like. But infrastructure changes would be slow and difficult to achieve. Now, of course, on the West Coast, and particularly in Scotland, the additional issue is will there be what will be the resolution in Northern Ireland? Because if the resolution in Northern Ireland is one that makes a seamless border north-south, would that increase any activity east-west? Now, you know, this is very much resisted by sections in Northern Ireland. You can understand that. We wouldn't welcome it ourselves. But the reality of the situation is that might create circumstances in which they would require to be more. Now, you know, it is difficult to see. I mean, I've, I, I know a little from discussing this with people. It's difficult to see how Cairn Ryan could be expanded quickly or at all. Uh, you know, it would be difficult to see how our Drossen could change substantially. That would be a possibility. So there would be issues in there. But until you know, you can't decide what you're going to do. If you, are, if you have contingency plans to do it, they wouldn't be cheap, I have to say. And then you say, where are we going to get the resource to do this? You know, so uh, it's, it's one of those issues that a decision is required. The longer there isn't any clarity in decision, the harder it will be. And based on that, you would have to come to the conclusion that any transition period would have to be substantial because, as you say, developing infrastructure takes time. Oh, ab absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, my last discussion with the Chamber of Shipping, which is probably six more than six months ago i mean they were talking about five to ten years to be able to make infrastructure changes now you know that that probably isn't unreasonable yeah and just one very brief final question uh, minister um in 2016 into 17 the scottish government engaged quite extensively with the eu 27 uh, one-on-one -on -one engagement with member states to explain scotland's position and um, this committee has heard from yourself and uh, the cabinet secretary around that i was wondering if you could give us an update on if that has continued in in recent months Oh, yes, and we continue to have a very useful, productive dialogue. I mean, it's very much part of our uh, a duty to do so. Um, Fiona Hislop obviously takes responsibility for that. Uh, I take responsibility for the intra-UK activity. But we, I, I'm involved in it, and of course through the Brussels hub, which is 
been upgraded and, and works uh, you know, very closely to talk to a wide range of people. And we do it all the time and we'll continue to do it. It's very important that people know our position. This uh, Scotland's place in Europe has been a, a, you know, an additional advantage. Uh, we've made sure that that is widely read and widely distributed. Uh, and we've had some very positive feedback to it from uh, EU27 countries. Thank you. Thank you. And th can I thank the Minister for giving evidence today and his officials and uh, well done in recovering from your earlier bout of illness. I'm grateful to you. I'm grateful to you. Thank uh, you very that, much. Thank you. That concludes the public part of the meeting today and I now move into private session.